Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, we've been talking a lot about sturm liouville problems, and in particular, we have really tried to focus on how they apply to partial differential equations. Now, in doing so, I would like to return to a PDE, and I would like to solve that PDE, and I would like to use some of the sturm liouville theory that we've already seen and show how things like the Rayleigh quotient and trial functions can be useful to us. So here I'm going to talk about vibrations of a non-uniform spring. Let's start with the PDE that we're interested in. Here I'm going to have rho of x d squared du of t. So this is going to be the wave equation t naught partial uh, squared u partial x. And in our case, we could have both t and rho being functions of x, pardon me, so here. So this is a non-uniform string. That means that our, say, density and some of our other quantities across our string from the derivation of this thing, these things could vary over the string. Okay, let's do something a little bit more complicated, right? We've, we've worked with constant density strings and where these things are constant and we get a c squared and everything is good. But now the question is, how do we tackle this kind of problem? Now, here I'm going to put simple boundary conditions on this thing. I'm going to put pinned boundary conditions, okay? So remember that this is, this is really sort of a very physical, simple example, because this is, this is your guitar string. This is your, your violin string, right? This is something that is pinned. There is no vibrations at zero. And so you can imagine a plucking, a sort of initial disturbance. And that initial disturbance would be captured by the initial conditions. So you would get, uh, say, the initial disturbance of the string would be some function f of x. And also you would have to capture, uh, pardon me, this should be t, its initial, its derivative's initial disturbance given uh, by some function g of x, right? And the reason that we need two initial conditions, I remind you, is because this is second order in time, right? Okay, so what we could do is we could apply separation of variables here. So separation of variables, right? SOV. Here I would do the same thing that I've been doing over and over and again, right? I set u, I separate out the, the independent variables, I use u as a function of phi of x and h of t, okay? Now, we've, we know how to do this, right? Um, this gives an SL problem. Remember, everything comes down to the sturm liouville part of this, so I'm really just going to focus on the sturm liouville part. Uh, in this case, the sturm liouville problem looks like this. t naught partial squared uh, phi partial uh, x, uh, pardon me, yeah, partial, uh, partial x squared, and then plus lambda rho of x uh, phi is equal to zero. And I'm going to make my life sim simple, and I'm going to assume that t is constant here, okay? So if you wanted t to be non-constant, you could just pull it over and divide off uh, the or put it into the row term here. And that's just so that this actually becomes the proper form, right? So, so again, if you wanted to use t to be a function of x, just divide it off and put it over with the row, right? So just so that everything sort of lines up and you get a proper sturm liouville problem, okay? So you just have to be a little bit careful about how you put this thing together. But in this case now, I'm just going to assume that this is constant. Just make my life a little easier so that this is a proper sturm liouville problem, right? Okay, so then I've also got boundary conditions associated with this. I have L is equal to zero. And here I, I accidentally used the, uh, the partial derivative, but of course this thing is just a single variable function. This is really just a standard derivative. So what should we want out of this? Well, we expect... Now, what is it that we should expect? That the eigenfunction or the eigenvalues are positive. Why would we want to expect that? Well, remember that the function for h 
of t, the, the differential equation, is really just h double prime. So let's maybe just sort of write this here. h double prime is equal to minus lambda h. Right? That's the other piece of the separation of variables equation, the non-Sturm Liouville part of this thing. And if lambda is positive, these things, the solutions are sines and cosines. And that's what we would expect, right? If you're sort of vibrating a string, what happens? Well, it vibrates in both space and time, right? So maybe it vibrates with this semi-unusual pattern, and that comes from the inhomogeneity here. Right? So maybe its vibrations in space are a little bit more complicated. You know, maybe part of the spring is a little more wiggly over here and a little more stiff over here. But by and large, its time dynamics should still be nice wiggles. Otherwise, these things would be exponential functions and your, your spring would just go whoom and it would fly apart. Right? And so, of course, we expect that lambda should be positive here. So how do we actually show that? Let's use the Rayleigh quotient. Okay, the Rayleigh quotient tells us that lambda is equal to, okay, so here we have t naught, the constant, integral from zero to L of d phi dx squared dx divided by the integral from zero to L of phi squared rho dx. Okay, so let's take a look at this thing for a second. This tells us that, okay, this is non-negative. T naught has to be non-negative for this to be physical. Rho has to be positive, And phi squared is non-negative. So the, the whole thing is non-negative. So at least we know that the eigenvalues are non-negative. There's no negative eigenvalues. That's good, right? But again, we wanted positive here. So that's the first thing that we can do with this Rayleigh quotient. So what if lambda is equal to zero, right? If lambda is equal to zero, this tells me that d phi dx is zero everywhere. Why? Because the only way that the Rayleigh quotient is going to be zero is if the, the top, right, is zero. And the, the, the only way you can integrate something that's positive to zero or something that's not negative to zero is if it's zero itself. So what does this tell me? Phi is a constant. Okay, so it's a constant function, but what's the issue? Well, the boundary conditions, so the boundary conditions imply phi is equal to zero, right? So if it's constant everywhere, it has to go through zero at the endpoints, then it has to be zero everywhere. So therefore, we've just proven, without actually knowing you know, the, the specifics of the spring, or of the string, pardon me, therefore, all eigenvalues are positive, which means oscillations in time. OK, so good, right? Our, our problem is physical. That's good. So it's a sort of sanity check for ourselves, right? We have theoretical mathematics telling us uh, that things sort of behave the way, or you know, this equation governs what we see in reality. And also, we have an explicit solution for this thing, right? It's an eigenfunction expansion. So here I've got a n and then sine root lambda n t phi n of x plus the sum of bn cos root lambda n t phi n, right? So the, the time profiles, they come from sines and cosines, whereas the spatial profiles, these are the eigenfunctions of the sturm liouville problem. Also, bn is going to come from my f of x function. So again, you use the orthogonality of sturm liouville here. You get f of x and then phi n of x rho of x. You have to have that weighting term in there divided by the integral from 0 to L 
of phi n of x, rho of x. Remember, rho of x here is a, is a weighting factor for our orthogonality condition. And, pardon me, a n. Okay, well, a n is going to come from taking a derivative. That means that when you take a derivative in time, you get a square root of lambda n coming out of that thing. So you're going to have to divide off a square root of lambda n. But this thing is very, very similar. It's just the projection g of x onto each one of the eigenfunctions according to the weight that was given by uh, the original sturm liouville problem. Okay, so you can find each of these coefficients, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to use the Rayleigh quotient in order to get a little bit more information about lambda one, right? Because again, lambda one is really the sort of critical oscillation. Everything else is just a harmonic multiple of lambda one, right? So here the question becomes, you know, what is lambda one? Or at least can we get some information about it? Now, let's use the minimization principle, okay? So this is what we introduced in the previous video. Zero to L, du dx squared, dx divided by uh, the integral, zero to L of u squared, rho dx. Okay. So rho is really sort of capturing the density of this string as it varies. So let's assume, so suppose, suppose that some number rho min is less than or equal to rho of x, which is less than or equal to rho max, okay? So, so let's imagine this, this um, string, it varies in density over, you know, over its length, but there is some minimum density that's positive, of course, and there's some maximum density, right? So, so x is from a compact set, it's from zero to L. So, you know, this is really just an extreme value uh, application. Well then, what can this tell me about my lambda one? Well, it can tell me something kind of interesting because take a look at what this does. Okay, so T naught, that thing is a constant, and let's use the fact that this thing is bounded above by rho max. It's one over, right? So essentially here I get T naught over rho max times the minimum of uh, zero to L, and then, okay, so the same thing, squared dx divided by the integral from zero to L of u squared dx. This is less than or equal to lambda one, which is less than or equal to, and then now going the other direction using rho min, t naught over rho min, and then the minimization of zero to L uh, of du dx squared dx divided by the integral from zero to L u squared dx. So the question is, does that help me at all, right? Well, I hope it does because, or I hope you see that it does, because now we've got a Rayleigh quotient for a different sturm liouville problem. This is the sturm liouville problem that I worked on at the end of the previous video, right? And in particular, we know the answer to this thing. We know what the minimization of this is, right? It's the same boundary conditions, right? Dirichlet boundary conditions. The only difference is the weight function now has been pulled out. So when you have a one here, and you can get rid of the t naught, then the weight function here, or then this is like the, the harmonic oscillation. It's a really, really easy one. And we know that the answer here is pi squared over L. So essentially what this does is this tells me this thing is equal to pi over L squared. And so is this thing because it's the same sturm liouville problem. And so essentially, this tells me that T naught over rho max times pi over L squared is less than or equal to lambda one, which is less than or equal to T naught 
over rho min times pi over lambda, or pi over L squared. And in particular, we have a square root of lambda 1 in here. So let's take a square root of both sides. And now I get, so pi over L times the square root of t naught over rho max is less than or equal to the square root of lambda 1, which is less than or equal to pi over L square root of t naught rho min. And what you can see is that the closer rho min and rho max are together, the tighter this bound is going to be, of course, right? And that makes sense because when rho min and rho max are equal to each other, this thing becomes constant and you can get exactly the value of lambda one because it really, you know, after factoring out some constants becomes a sturm liouville problem we can solve. However, this gives you a lot of information, right? It gives you a nice interval that your lowest frequency of oscillation has to belong to. Doesn't tell you exactly where. You could do that with trial functions, right? You could try and get some more information using trial functions. But this leverages something we know in order to get something new, right? So this is sort of the power of the Rayleigh quotient. It tells us a lot about you know, how we can manipulate these expressions and how we can, even if we don't know exactly what these solutions to the sturm liouville problem are, we can still get information about the original partial differential equation. Okay, when we come back in the next video, we're going to look at what's called eigenvalue, or eigenvector, eigenfunction expansions. Okay, so we're going to leverage these sturm liouville problems to solve non-homogeneous partial differential equations. That's whenever you have a source term, for example, added on the back here. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.